behalf of the Patient Safety Authority, I'd like to welcome you to this webinar titled Ligature Risk, Continuing to Safeguard Your Hospitals. My name is Chris Mamerill, and I'll be your moderator for this program. Now I'd like to introduce our speakers for the webinar. Melanie Motz is a Senior Patient Safety Liaison with the Patient Safety Authority. She interacts with patient safety officers and other various healthcare staff in healthcare facilities across the eastern region of Pennsylvania in an effort to decrease patient harm. Tina Kephart is the Director of Behavioral Health at Mount Nittany Medical Center. Passionate about the need to increase education and awareness and decrease the stigma associated with mental illness, Tina focuses her energies on providing safe, quality, patient-centered care. Shauna Bainey Shaw is a Risk Manager with Mount Nittany Medical Center. As the Risk Manager, Shauna is responsible for facilitating root cause analysis and patient safety meetings at her organization, among her other risk duties. Carol Van Zyl is the Director of Behavioral Health Regulatory Compliance and Accreditation at UPMC Western Psychiatric Hospital. In addition to her role in regulatory, Carol oversees patient safety risk management, patient relations, and the patient experience. She has worked closely with many UPMC hospitals to ensure their knowledge of ligature risk requirements and has been actively involved with conducting risk assessments in emergency departments, critical care, and medical units. Mel, I will now turn the program over to you. Thank you, Chris, and thank you everyone for taking the time to join us today. Uh, our objectives for today. At the end of this presentation, uh, you'll be able to utilize the information and resources we provide, with, provide you today and hopefully improve ligature risk assessment and mitigation plans within your facility. We will be providing a couple sample handouts during the webinar to assist you with this task. Uh, also, Shauna and Tina from Mount Nittany are going to help you identify some challenges and considerations in going through a unit-wide renovation. And lastly, Carol uh, will be discussing the process of performing ligature and suicide risk reviews in different inpatient care settings, such as the EDs, med surge units, psych units, etc. So. Before we get started, I want to make sure that we identify uh, specifically what is ligature risk. So according to the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, ligature risk is defined as anything which is load-bearing and could be used to attach a cord, rope, or other material for hanging strangulation, uh, such as a blanket, a bed sheet, a towel. Uh, the most common ligature points include doors, hooks, handles, windows, um, and sheets and towels. So, in terms of the scope of the problem, according to the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, suicide is the 10th leading cause of death in the country, and it's the 11th in the state of Pennsylvania, and the second leading cause of death for ages 15 through 34, which is pretty staggering, uh, with an average of six people dying by suicide each day in the state. So, in terms of, you know, what we're seeing in our PACERS data across the state, uh, since 2015, we've seen a total of 22 suicide deaths, with half of these occurring on inpatient units in hospitals, nine of those involving hanging, um, most commonly the bathroom door. Um, you know, for some examples here, we've seen pants um, from the bathroom door, bedding over a bathroom door, bed sheets. Uh, so, nine of those 11, as you can see, um, those bathroom doors are the, are the most common we've seen in the state of Pennsylvania. Also, um, some more statistics from PACERS, over 90 injuries uh, we've seen from attempted suicide, with half of those involving hanging or attempted hanging. Um, patients denied suicidal ideation or were assessed as low risk prior to approximately 20% of inpatient suicide attempts that resulted in injury and over 120 injuries from self-mutilation are not classified as attempted suicide. And unfortunately, um, we don't know the number of attempts without injury as those are reported as infrastructure failures and we do not see those here at the Patient Safety Authority. So in this past year, um, you know, we decided um, as, the, as the PSL team, um, the past few years we've been putting on um, facility-focused year-long keystone projects 
And we made the decision um, based upon some of the data we are seeing, um, some of the information coming down from regulatory bodies, and just talking with our facilities that, you know, really focusing on ligature risk is, is something that, you know, maybe we should take a look at. Uh, so we did choose to move forward with this project. Uh, we started it in July of 2018 and just wrapped it up, actually, uh, the end of June this year. So really the goal of this program was to exchange information and resources related to ligature risk assessment between us, the authority, and our Pennsylvania hospitals. Uh, we went at this uh, several different ways. Uh, at the facility level, we as the patient safety liaisons went out to our hospitals and did interviews with our patient safety officers uh, to kind of get an idea of, you know, what are their current processes and programs in place in assessing risk within their facilities. Uh, we did this with our acute care hospitals, behavioral health. Um, so we, you know, really had these one-on-one -on -one conversations and, uh, you know, got to know kind of what they were, uh, what they were dealing with within their facilities. At the regional level, we held uh, four regional programs specifically uh, on how to conduct um, proactive risk assessment and ligature risk assessments. We held those last September of 2018. Um, and we've also have done some on-site education, uh, a shorter version of how to do a proactive risk assessment and ligature risk assessment, which we are still doing. And if you are interested, you know, please reach out to your patient safety liaison. This is training that we can provide you and your facility. And then statewide, uh, we conducted a risky rooms contest. And this is actually how we um, kicked off our program in August of last year, which I will talk about in a little bit. So, like I said, uh, at the facility level, um, patient safety officers, when we met with them, uh, we went through a, a we, call it, we called it a gap analysis, so kind of a list of questions to identify, you know, if there were any gaps and, you know, what, what they were doing in their facilities. And um, if there were gaps identified, we had a list of resources to help them in, you know, looking at, you know, if they, they weren't sure if they had a validated suicide screening tool, uh, we had a some resources, uh, a validated screening tools. If they were unsure, you know, who was involved with the risk assessment processes and if they, you know, not sure, you know, how often maybe a, a risk assessment was being done on their units, uh, we had some resources for them. Um, we talked about training and what type of training what they, what they were doing with our staff. Um, so it was a, a really great discussion that we had um, with our facilities. We also provided on-site consultations um, and walk arounds on units. Uh, so some facilities were going through renovations of units. Uh, they were, you know, building new units, new hospitals, um, and they invited us to come out to kind of be that outside eye to, you know, give some feedback. Um, and then we also published three communiques uh, throughout that year, um, noting, you know, updated information that we were learning from facilities, almost like a report card. Um, of, you know, what we were learning in visiting our facilities. Um, we also um, noted some recent literature that we thought was beneficial to share with our facilities. So, in summary, um, you know, what did we learn? Um, of the 192 facilities we visited, um, almost half of those having behavioral health units um, and the other half having either behavioral health units or were standalone uh, behavioral health hospitals, we found that 44% um, of facilities were unsure of what type of suicide risk assessment tool they were using, um, or, you know, if they, they knew they were using one, uh, they knew that maybe it wasn't validated. Um, and then we also found um, for those, excuse me, 31% were using the Columbia screening, uh, Eighteen percent were using another validated tool, such as the UPMC or Joint Commission tool, and seven percent were using the PHQ. Some other notable data we found um, in visiting our facilities: um, the dark blue uh, there. That is the percentage in this chart here. Percentage of uh, facilities discussing ligature risk in their patient safety committees. So you can see as the year went on, um, you know, almost 40% of facilities we visited in the July through October timeframe uh, were discussing it in their patient safety committees. And 
as the, the keystone in the year went on, we saw that um, facilities were discussing it more in their patient safety committees, which is great. So, you know, they may be doing their ligature risk assessments and, and setting that report up to talk about in patient safety and, you know, talking about, you know, what are some solutions um, for mitigating some of this risk that we're seeing. Uh, in the brighter blue here, this is the percentage of facilities providing training to their staff within their facilities. Um, so, you know, whether this was staff that do, you know, uh, regular one-to-one one -one, um, for high-risk patients or overall, you know, risk assessment across the hospital, uh, we also saw an increase in that throughout the year. Um, you know, and we are, like I said, able to help you in providing some of that training. So please reach out to your patient safety liaison if you are interested in something like that. Like I said, we did a risky rooms contest. This is you know, how we um, started off, kind of started off our, our project. Uh, we did this in the month of August. And um, basically what we did, we released one care area each week and asked patient safety officers to invite facility staff uh, to identify the most ligature points. And whoever identified the most ligature points won a gift card. Uh, it was a really fun way um, to get this information out to uh, Pennsylvania. And, uh, you know, we, we had some, some participants identify over 30 ligature risks. Um, so, since then, uh, we actually have now six rooms. Um, we have a behavioral health room, an ICU, an ER, a hallway, a med surge room, and a bathroom. Um, and these are posted on our website, and I put the link here on the slide. Uh, so feel free to access it, it is free. Um, facilities have told us uh, that they are using it for staff training and education, and um, you know, our, they're using our risky rooms, you know, helping them doing their own risk assessments and mitigation plans. Uh, so please take advantage uh, of that education we have posted on the website. So clearly reducing uh, the risk of suicide um, is a focus from a regulatory standpoint. And, you know, while we were working on our Keystone project, the Joint Commission released pre-publication standards uh, regarding revised elements performance for national patient safety goal, reducing the risk of suicide. Um, so I wanted to talk about uh, two of them uh, because this first one, uh, conducting an environmental risk assessment that identifies features in the physical environment that could be used to attempt suicide. Um, you know, this is very important, um, you know, for, for all facilities. Um, and I think it's important to note, you know, the expectation for, you know, the non-inpatient behavioral health care settings and the non-psych units is not necessarily to be ligature resistant, uh, but rather, you know, making sure you're doing assessments and taking action uh, to protect those high-risk individuals um, from those risks in the environment. So, you know, this may be coming up with a checklist, um, kind of as a, a visual cue for your staff uh, to remove any extra items that might be in, you know, one of your med surge rooms. So there's, if there's extra IV poles, um, though I know there's not always extra of those, but there may be, um, extra chairs, extra linens. Um, so, you know, making a checklist as a, as a reminder of, you know, if we are taking care of a patient uh, that may be considered high risk. Um, it may just be a, a transitional room that they're in, uh, but making sure to remove uh, any risk, I think, would be beneficial. And though um, this uh, element of performance too, screening all patients for suicidal ideation using a validated screening tool, um, this specifically um, is for psychiatric hospitals and patients being evaluated or treated for behavioral health conditions as their primary reason for care in a general hospital. However, um, in reading their R3 report, I thought it was important to note uh, that, you know, even though universal screening is not required in all hospitals, it may be considered um, in order to include those individuals who have comorbid health conditions, um, such as, you know, maybe a patient in your facility just received a terminal diagnosis um, or your postpartum patient. Um, you know, there, there are individuals that we are taking care of in our facilities that may not have a mental health um, 
diagnosis, but do have suicidal ideations. Uh, there was a, a longitudinal study published in the Journal of General Internal Medicine that found that 80%, 83% of people who committed suicide had contact with the healthcare provider within a year prior to death. Uh, so, you know, there are patients out there, like I said, um, who may not have that mental health diagnosis, but maybe dealing with some psychosocial things or, um, you know, having a hard time at home um, and, you know, are, are coming in contact with a healthcare provider. So, you know, universal screening is maybe something you may consider. Some relevant resources, uh, lots of resources um, and the references here, but I wanted to make sure I note a couple of them here. Uh, the Joint Commission, currently their suicide prevention portal, um, it is free. Uh, so please take advantage um, of looking at some of the resources. There's some great stuff on there. And then the, the CMS draft ligature risk interpretive guidelines. Uh, hospitals are expected um, or potentially are expected to provide education and training to all patient care and patient care employees on environmental patient safety risk factors. Um, so, you know, the way I read this and the way I interpret it, all, all patient care um, and then those, those non-patient care employees who are going to be working in patient care areas, so your security, your housekeeping, your dietary, uh, you know, so basically everybody in your hospital is, is going to be responsible for, you know, understanding and identifying environmental risks. Um, so take advantage of our risky rooms, possibly, um, as an education piece uh, to share with uh, your staff and educating them about uh, some of the different uh, ligature and self-harm risks. And then lastly, uh, the New York State Office of Mental Health um, has a comprehensive list of products. Um, this is a, a really great uh, list of products that is updated on a regular basis, uh, ligature risk products uh, that have been uh, reviewed and tested by the state office. And I, I did put the um, link to their website, link to that um, resource website there. Um, and I think it's important to know that this is being updated on a regular basis. When we first started this Keystone project, um, they were on version 15, and that was in July. 2018, and currently uh, they're on version 21. So it's been changed six times and updated six times since then. So it is a, a very um, active and, and great resource for your reference. So what can we learn from each other? Um, I think, you know, th there's a lot we can learn from each other, and we learn so much, you know, from Pennsylvania facilities and you know, we wanted to be sure that, you know, we could share even more information with facilities and, and helping with their risk and, and mitigation plan. So uh, we had uh, a facility that was willing to share um, one of their site safe room checklists. And this is a sample uh, that we're actually going to be sending out uh, via the chat box uh, for you to review and to uh, modify uh, to your you know, liking for your facility and make it, you know, facility or unit specific. Um, this is just kind of a good starting place. Um, I want to be clear that we don't specifically um, endorse uh, a specific checklist or risk assessment. Uh, we are, you know, really here to, to share this information and we, we thank um, the facility for, you know, letting us share this with the, the state of Pennsylvania today. And then the second reference, um, handout we're going to be sending out via the chat box is um, from the Joint Commission. Uh, this is an adaptable environmental risk assessment. Uh, this risk assessment, again, um, can be modified, you know, for your own personal use within your facility. Uh, it's really great. It's a great starting point, um, you know, to look at, you know, there, this touch, touches base on, you know, behavioral health units, non-behavioral health units, you know, general safety concerns, EDs. Uh, so, you know, please take advantage of this. And that concludes my part of the presentation. And I am going to pass it over to Tina. Thank you, Mel. Um, I'm going to open up us talking about our steps to renovating our behavioral health unit here at Mount Nittany. Um, it's quite a challenging project. Our unit was built in the early 80s, and so we have very old um, physical plant space. 
We've been making slow progress over the last number of years on ongoing risk mitigation. Um, but last year, uh, Mount Nittany moved forward with a rapid risk mitigation plan after we re-reviewed the interpretive guidelines in preparation for our upcoming Joint Commission visit, which we were within the six just approaching the six-month window at that point. Um, our new chapter leaders and our new executive leadership um, really reviewed that and offered a, a fresh perspective and, and past experiences that we hadn't necessarily had at our organization in the past, so that was very helpful. So we conducted another um, quick risk assessment by an internal team, and then the leadership team fully supported an all-out mitigation plan with dedicated resources and financial support, which really enabled us to be able to address those issues that we knew were um, an ongoing or longstanding issue that um, needed addressed quickly. So we developed a mitigation plan um, with multiple phases. With the initial phase, um, with the plan um, to eliminate and address the imminent risks. With their support, we were able to collaborate with our plant services, um, our contractors that were pretty much at that point dedicated just to the behavioral health renovations, as well as our um, nursing staff on our unit and our providers, and then also engaging with other departments because during that initial risk mitigation phase, we actually decided to decrease our census down to half so that we could place all of our patients in a private room. As while we were doing work in the rooms, one of the issues we um, eliminated was the removal of the bathroom door. <clears throat> um, so we could not semi-private rooms at that point. Um, we were able to finish that phase in about six weeks. Um, a lot of creativity occurred during that six-week period. We had folks coming up with ideas on a daily basis, reworking them, trialing them. Even our contractors, one of our contractors actually came up with an idea of how to modify our, what were safety curtains at that point in time, but no longer allowed to have the track for the curtains, with a way to modify the curtains that we had until we could order um, safety blinds for the rooms. Um, then we moved to phase two, and that was a little slower pace, but definitely steady progress um, while we researched supplies, ordered things, um, and then arranged for delivery for installation on about the last, I'd say, six months after that, probably. Um, we still just are adding the very final touches to the unit at this point. Um, so leadership engagement was key for us. That's something that we, um, <clears throat> if we had not had that, this would not have been possible for us. Um, in prep for that, that was all done in preparation and ongoing um, readiness for Joint Commission, but also to ensure the safety of our staff, our patients, our providers. Um, we did get our Joint Commission survey earlier than anticipated, and we were able to um, get through that um, evaluation with just one recommendation, which was for changing out our outlet and lighting covers to metal. So otherwise, the other mitigation things that we had done were accepted by the Joint Commission, and we were quite pleased with the creativity that went into some of that. The next part that was crucial um, for us was the staff engagement. My staff prided themselves on having a very warm, cozy, home-like environment for our patients that they felt comfortable and safe in. So when we did the rapid um, mitigation plan, it, we a lot of things disappeared on the unit that made it warm, cozy, and feeling safe. Um, so that was hard. The staff struggled with um, basically the institutional feel of the unit, as well as the lack of comfort and home-like environment for the patients. Add to that the noise and contractors on and off the unit all the time. That wasn't just people, it was also the increased surveillance that was required by the staff to monitor the use of equipment and tools on the unit and that nothing fell off a cart. Um, it also was a disruption to the workflow and the care environment and that if we were working on said room today, we had to shuffle everybody multiple times or hold therapies in different spaces in different rooms, all of which also could have been disrupted. Um, but we made that work. Um, it was really important to the staff to provide frequent updates and also to engage them in, okay, this, we had to change this, but what would you think would be a better alternative? The other lesson um, that we learned was um, patient experience and comfort. We, we did periodically, um, I did as the manager, the director, <coughs> periodically meet with the patients 
to apologize for the noise, the disruption, um, explain and provide education about why we were doing it to provide a safer environment for them, any family that may visit, visitors for my staff or the providers that worked on the unit. And most of the patients were very, very accepting of that. I think probably the biggest struggle for the patients was the 7 a.m. wake up call with the noise for construction, as well as um, just the intrusion of vendors and contractors being on the unit all the time. We do have a high volume of patients with trauma-based histories and um, just the abrupt noise or the abrupt appearance of a non-staff member could alarm them sometimes. So we did work really closely with our contractors on um, touching base with the staff when they were going to go into a particular area or an unplanned um, modification needed, needed that day so that we could arrange um, for the patient to be in a different area or um, rearrange things as we needed to. Um, the, the one thing that I feel like I, that we learned as a team was, although we were doing daily verbal communications, um, the plan changed frequently throughout the course of a day, depending on what we ran into, and it didn't always get conveyed in a way to the next shift that perhaps would have been uh, more calming to the staff. So I think, you know, if you are looking to do more modifications to your unit, um, a whiteboard might be helpful to be able to write what the plans are and it's an easy fix rather than sending 15 emails a day in regards to what changes may be occurring in a schedule or a plan. We did occasionally have to alter plans for um, an activity or a project on the unit because one of our patients perhaps was having a bad day, they'd escalated and had an episode of violence that we weren't gonna add additional risks to the unit. So all those things had to be taken into consideration. Um, Despite all that, the staff did maintain a very, very positive attitude um, and worked with the patients daily on, on how they could learn to cope with some of these things. And we would modify whatever we could to increase the comfort for them. Um, one tip that helped my staff a lot, because a lot of them struggled with understanding the change in the ligature risk assessment as it was. We'd, I mean, our unit was safe and in their eyes in the sense that all the things that we had used to hang pictures or types of furniture or whatever were approved in the past for mental health settings um, because they were in common areas and that was no longer the case. Those things couldn't be monitored via cameras or individuals any longer. So um, one tip that we were given by one of our mockers was if a shoelace size string can be threaded through anything, it is then considered a ligature risk. So we have a shoelace that lives in our staff room that at any point someone gets concerned about something, they can check that. And that did help them be able to visualize what ligature risk could mean for a patient with something that didn't look to be risky. Um, so moving on just to the leadership engagement a little bit more. <coughs> Um, one thing I think it's important if, if you're working in, in an organization that um, leadership is not all that familiar with behavioral health or um, struggles with the changes related to behavioral health, I would suggest there's lots of research out there and evidence-based practice um, and also the current industry standards that you can use to apply to your facility and do a presentation to them. It helped us in that we had um, a Joint Commission Accreditation Coordinator here at Mount Nittany who was active in all of these plans and also could take that time to research some of that for us and then we could apply it as part of the team here at the organization. Another thing was doing timely and routine risk assessment. Um, I think that was things that facilities struggle with. You do a risk assessment, you'd identify things. You, we, in the past, always would identify things that needed immediate remedy. We would do so, and then the things that were like, well, this could be or that could be, sometimes didn't get placed on a timeline or didn't have resources. And so we had to um, really work in this new process of developing a routine and scheduled practice to do our risk assessment. The other thing was just, I would encourage facilities to, when they have safety concerns, continue to escalate those up the chain. Um, keep reporting to ensure safety. I mean, if you don't have safety for your patients, your visitors, your staff, you're really not gonna be able to provide much of a program because these folks can't get well in an unsafe environment. Um, 
And then if you have identified risk that can't be immediately mitigated, have a plan in place in writing that you can demonstrate that you're working towards, again, with a timeline so that you can have an outcome um, that you can show movement and that you get to that place. So the next screen, um, we took lots of pictures of the unit. We're still probably missing some that I would like to have shared, but we had to be creative. Our unit became very bare <coughs> and barren. Um, so again, I mentioned earlier, we had an old physical plant built in the 1980s. I think it was 81. Um, so a lot of the modifications um, proved very challenging and potentially expensive because of the old physical plant. A lot of things just couldn't be swapped out. We had to creatively look for things that would work. A um, couple of pictures we have up there. One is of our card key access. A lot of newer facilities have their card key accesses um, recessed into the wall with plates over them. We couldn't do that initially because of the types of walls we have in the department, so we used half-round molding over those to keep them from being a ligature risk, and then we caulked we used so much pick-proof caulking that I don't even know how many cases we ordered, but a lot. Um, artwork was a big thing. It was very not homey, so a cheap fix for us was we bought calendars that were on sale for a dollar at the end of the year, laminated them, and put them up with Velcro dots. Um, those, the patients really liked having that added back. I heard lots of um, pleasure from both patients and staff when we were able to add some artwork back to the unit. Um, Another is our fire alarms that are key operated. Um, we use the half round mounting on those as well. I think I already mentioned the contractor that at home sewed Velcro on our curtains as we had to take down the tracks so that we could put them up temporarily. Um, moving on to the patient rooms, which we know is the highest risk area for inpatient behavioral health units because the patients there are unattended in most instances, especially the bathrooms. Um, because we are a hospital-based psych unit, we do get a higher volume of patients that often are coming from the medical floors with some um, coexisting medical conditions. So we do have electric hospital beds. They are the psychiatric beds. We have modified them additionally to what comes from the manufacturer to be able to use them on the unit safely. Um, we have shortened the cords down to, depending on the plug, in a particular room, 12 to 14 inches. They are locked in the lowest position. The staff have the code and can be, they're the only ones that can modify the settings for the patient. Um, we did move from regular old hospital nightstands to open nightstands. Um, they are secured to the wall and the floor, as well as they have pick-proof caulking, caulking around them so that no one can use them as a ligature point. And because of the open nature, they can't hide things and the drawers aren't ligature risks. Um, the next one's our bathroom door. This was one of the things we struggled with the longest. We had been, we'd identified our doors actually several years ago, and we're struggling because of the old physical plant to find something that would work. We ended up going with these doors that have the, um, the angled top, but that top actually can still come up for additional privacy, but a five pound weight on it makes that go down in, and so the um, ligature could not be attached. <coughs> And then our bathrooms, that's our general bathroom in our patient room, um, has ligature resistant paper towel and soap dispensers. Um, again, also the mirror. And then we have the safety rails for patients that have uh, mobility issues. Um, those are closed in handrails. And then our faucet also is ligature resistant. And then all the piping underneath the counters are um, closed in and closed. Um, so it can be challenging when we have issues, like when the faucets need recharged or batteries or the temperature regulated, um, it's quite an adventure for maintenance to take that apart to get into that. Our activity and group room were separate rooms at one point, but we had a room divider that we also identified it was a risk, so we did remove that and make one big open room. We actually really much, we very much like the new big room. Um, we eliminated all of our bulletin boards that had educational material for the patients on them. We created a new whiteboard by putting a whiteboard sticker on the wall, and then we um, made a frame for the whiteboard using like old school type um, paper borders that look like wood. Um, that has gone over well. It looks just like a bulletin board or a whiteboard. 
we also had to buy all new furniture, although our furniture was heavy enough not to be identified as a uh, risk for throwing. It unfortunately had open arms, um, and we did have arms because we have a lot of patients that need assistance with getting up and down. So we had to replace those. Um, lesson learned with these chairs. We ordered these chairs after we'd already ordered from the same company earlier other chairs. And the base of the chairs, we originally were going to go with wood to add some warmth to the to the room. And unfortunately, what we were not aware of is that when you have wooden bases on those chairs, then they are not weightable. So we actually had that lesson we learned. We had to swap out the bases on the chairs. Um, so these are the plastic, they weigh about 100 pound chairs. They're weighted with sand. We added those to both our group room and our activity room. You'll also see in the second picture there the blinds that we're using. All of the hardware is encased and, um, and about a five pound will break the, the thing that, the mechanism that helps the blind work. So those have worked very well for us. Um, the next room that you see is our day room and our kitchen area. Um, again, our day room had heavy furniture. The furniture that was not super heavy, we did bolt to the floor, as well as um, the safety hardware on all of our furniture. Our TVs enclosed in like a library type system with shatterproof plexi. And we did learn a lesson there as well as that when you do that with your TV, if you don't use a prefabbed type of enclosure that you can purchase for behavioral health units. Um, ventilation for your TV as well as sound for the TV becomes an issue. So um, make sure you look at that when you're, when you're doing that. Um, our kitchen area um, was where one of our public phones was as well as we have one in the hallway. We ended up changing to a secured area type phone that has a cord that is non-detachable, does not stretch, and is about 14 inches long. Um, we have two of those in that same day area. Um, we even bought a different refrigerator because we had the old fashioned with the handles, um, so we wouldn't have a ligature point in the kitchen. Our chairs, that was one of our biggest struggles because the narrow space of our kitchen didn't allow us to get some of the bigger, bulkier chairs like we used in the activity and group room. They would not have fit for all of our patients. Um, so these chairs um, were a higher end chair that we were able to weight up to 100 pounds. Um, also, you'll notice that we have some safety locks on our refrigerator because we do occasionally get patients that um, overeat due to some of their conditions or they just can't stop themselves from getting in the fridge and guzzling. Um, so we do have those. They're more of a deterrent, actually five pounds, and also they'll fall off the fridge. But they do stop patients when they go um, to the refrigerator. Um, let me see here. Ceiling tiles also, I think you can see them. Because we had, we do have closed ceilings in all of our patient rooms and our group and activity rooms, but in our common areas, we did have drop ceiling. So we did have to caulk all of our ceiling tiles shut as an alternative because, um, again, because of older physical plant, a lot of our utility stuff is in our ceilings and has to be able to still be um, accessed. So that was the option that we opted to go with. The next slide is our front hallway. We had to change just about every door or the hinges and hardware on every door on the unit. Again, another challenge for us was finding hardware that worked with existing doors, or sometimes we'd actually change out the doors, um, as well as having closures that we could get in and out of the room if the patient attempted to barricade themselves. We changed out just about everything in the hallways. We added um, all new exit signs that were ceiling mounted. Say, um, our cameras are ceiling mounted. Uh, sprinkler heads, those were all changed out as well. Um, we also, uh, just received, we were struggling with our showers because we had the tracks with the Velcro curtains. I don't have a picture of those, but we had to take those down. We initially tried to just use the Velcro attached to the ceiling. That didn't work. So we have now just opted to use the soft suicide prevention doors. They just arrived this week. As well as we did get some artwork from the same company that's a soft suicide prevention type artwork. That has really helped the unit. The patients have been very verbal about enjoying having true artwork back on the unit as well as the staff. It really brightens up the unit.
Um, so just a few lessons I think I mentioned already in regards to some of those things. Definitely ask a lot of questions when you're ordering the supplies. Um, our chairs were, became an issue. Some of our hardware was a struggle for us. Um, on our shower doors, the hinges came on the opposite side because they changed the process and didn't convey that during the purchasing process. So we, we have run into a few obstacles that we've had to kind of backpedal and move forward. I just, I think it's important to remember just to keep everybody actively engaged and involved. So, Sean, I'm going to let you take over. Okay, some of our other lessons learned, I think it's really important some of the things that Tina talked about was how important the leadership involvement was. Um, if our organization wouldn't have went through such a large leadership change in the past year and a half, two years, I don't know that these changes would have came about so easily and been such a priority. So I think that's really important to look at when you're thinking of changes that need made. And also to include them in, you know, how expensive these items are and make sure you take it into account when they're talking about budget for the season. Um, staff engagement, I think we, Tina talked a lot about involving her staff, but I think it was important from my perspective at our daily safety huddles, um, Tina and our environmental services and facilities team talked about it almost on a weekly basis. Where are we at? What are we doing? Who's going to be here and who's involved and what the changes are? It was important to hear those points so that we knew what was going on and what we could see the changes happening. Um, there was a lot of education given to the staff here at the hospital. I think it's important that Tina discussed the education that was given to the vendors on the importance of this. This might be new to them if they've never worked in a hospital environment before and, you know, just the awareness of ligature risk and leaving a screw here, how dangerous that could be for a patient. Um, we did do some hands-on training with our staff as well as the vendors, letting them know what the ligature risk looked like and how easy it is for these items. And then as well as teaching them about the, the shoelace, you know, the vendors, when they installed something, they would even notice, hey, a shoelace still fits over this. I don't know that this is going to work. Um, I think that was really important. And just to remember that the goal is mitigation. Our patients still have all of their privacy, all of their sheets, their blankets, the things they need when it's appropriate. And just to keep them involved in the process that we're trying to make you as safe as possible, but please let us know if you're not comfortable with the environment that we've created for you. I think those are really important items. And I include our contact information on there. Um, the best way to contact either one of us would be email if you need anything from us, um, some of the equipment that you saw, if you saw anything you liked or wondered where Tina got a hold of that, you can just send, shoot us an email and we can get that for you. And I just included a picture of the doc here. This is one of the pictures that was used for the artwork that was um, placed in the showers of the hospital and on the unit for patients to kind of create that warm, cozy environment without having a picture on the wall it's now on their shower door um, of a cute little note. It's actually hanging upside down right now, if that gives you a little bit of a chuckle. Um, based on what Tina said, the hinge is being hung on the wrong side. So we're working on getting the replacement for that right now. Carol, I'm going to turn the program over to you. Um, thank you. Thanks, Sean. I appreciate it. So I'm going to talk a little bit today more about the medical side and what, what we're doing there, especially here at UPMC. So, you know, I think as has been said already, you know, you can't, you can't mitigate issues that we're not aware of. And so we certainly find that in our medical hospital.
that are laser points, but also those things that can be used for self-harm or a weapon towards others. We look at things that are in the way, the obstructions in a room, like in particular uh, curtains, especially in medical areas, um, the amount of equipment they have, um, you know, things that can be used for hanging or strangulation that are part of the care that goes on in a medical unit. Um, we look at things like what are the steps and the protocols and the safeguards that they need to put in place to keep suicidal patients um, safe. Um, we certainly at UPMC have a risk assessment that's done, uh, starts in the ED uh, for all patients, and it's a very, very similar screening tool that is used at Western Psych um, in terms of trying to get at that new, uh, trying to get at the patients who have some risk for suicide and so that they can begin the clock in terms of what they're going to do for their one-to-one -one mitigation. So we've completed risk assessments at all but one UPMC behavioral health hospital um, and all but one UPMC medical hospital, and I'm talking about the emergency rooms, med surge, and acute care, as I noted earlier. Plus, we've completed, um, this says one, but we've actually completed two in non-UPMC hospitals. Um, the Joint Commission so far in 2018 and early 2019 have, been, have given many accolades to the risk assessment tool, I think partly because folks are really in the hospitals taking this seriously because most medical folks are not trained to look at behavioral health patients the way that those who, who work in psych care are. And so I think they're taking this seriously, be part of it because of the Joint Commission and the pressure from the Joint Commission to do some of this, but also because they're having events in their hospital and they're trying to figure out what they need to do in their environment and with their education and training to keep our patients safe. Um, so typically, I mean, I do the risk assessments in most of our most of our areas. Um, we also involve the unit leadership and the regulatory folks who are in those hospitals. I interview staff, and I also interview staff who are, who are providing the one-on-one -on -one observation. I also demonstrate potential risk. I mean, oftentimes, um, folks in medical areas will not understand how that risk can happen, and I have been known to demonstrate a lot of those pieces, and I think that there's been many aha moments for medical to look at the fact that it only takes about four nitrile gloves tied together to create a, something that can be tied around a person's neck and then tied onto a ligature point. Uh, they don't rip very easily, and so those little kinds of demonstrations, I think, have been really helpful to the non-psych non folks to understand the risk potentials. I also really encourage folks to test processes, not only in medical, but in behavioral health as well. I think the tendency is to put a process in place, do an education, and then uh, walk away and assume those things are happening. But what I have found is that in many areas, they are not happening. We certainly have seen you know, one-to-one uh, -one sitters who are doing the observations in a medical area for a behavioral health patient who's at risk for suicide, who's reading a book, um, who's watching TV with the patient, who um, area items that were not removed from one one-to-one -one staff person to the next staff person or items that have been added into a room. So really testing those processes um, is really important. You know, certainly reviewing documents, reviewing the training that's being offered. Does the training include th things like ligature risk? Does it include um, developing a list of items that should be removed for, from a room that's not necessary for the care of the patient? So we look at things like, um, you know, again, what's not necessary. Obviously, the overhead lights and medical poles and those sorts of things, what we find is there's typically a lot of chairs, chairs with arms, they're very lightweight, the excess nitrile gloves. Um, oftentimes clipboards are hanging around. If you open up closets in medical rooms, they tend to have an excess of, you know, gowns for patients, uh, pillowcases and pillows. They may have excess towels or sheets and those sorts of things, hangers. Um, doing a lot of talking with them, of talking with medical staff about, you know, the risk those things pose and then can they identify a way to remove those items. In one of our hospitals in New York State, um, they developed the process of, they actually have a cart that they take, that they have available to them in medical units where they take the items off, the, out of the units that they don't need, out of the patient room, they put it in the cart, um, and then the cart gets removed from that area. But on top of that, they've also included the risk assessment and a PowerPoint regarding those, those items that can be at risk. So they've created a real training opportunity as well as a safe 
opportunity for um, those patient rooms. We also talk about, you know, the importance of when patients are being screened to be able to identify the risk level. You know, is a patient a high risk for suicide while they're in the hospital? What do those interventions need to look at versus those that are at low risk? Uh, we talk a lot to medical folks about, you know, that patient who oftentimes says no, no, no to when they're asked about suicide, but at the same time, that clinical um, feeling in your gut says, yeah, I'm really concerned about something that may be going on and being able to recognize the, their clinical piece of that as well. Um, so what are we learning? Lots of risk in metal ro medical rooms. The number of behavior, behavioral health patients presenting to ETs has grown dramatically over the past year to 18 months. Medical staff don't get training for behavioral health patients, and they don't understand the risk um, of what exists in a room, but also what gets brought into room by visitors. And not, not utilizing the one-to-one -one, uh, for those suicidal patients has led to events in medical hospitals. So what, uh, we're also learning that, you know, we can minimize the items that can be used for self-harm. You know, we could take a garbage can that has a plastic bag and put it outside. We can easily take and remove the excess gowns and those sorts of things, limit the number of boxes and nitro gloves. I think most of the hospitals I've been at have found that those processes have really been very, very easy changes for them. By conducting the thorough risk assessment in ED, the acute care and medical surgical areas and ensuring that all staff are being trained on what the risk is uh, beyond just the ligature, but also looking at things related to self-harm and weapon. By developing a list of items that can be removed from the patient rooms and training all staff involved on those lists. Um, and then again, training, training, training. You know, somebody mentioned earlier about training even our non-patient care staff. I mean, hospital uh, environmental services staff go into rooms all the time, oftentimes taking in a cart that does not necessarily have a lock on it with lots of items for so that folks really need to have that understanding about what is their particular responsibility and what may relate may late relate to potential issues for that behavioral health um, patient. And again, I can't say it enough, really testing processes. Don't assume that everybody's doing it right. Test your processes. Make sure that you're keeping those patients safe in a medical area. Um, uh, I'm going to pass it now over to you, Chris. Um, Thank you, Carol. Uh, we're going to move into our Q&A part of the program now. Um, if you have questions, please type them in the Q&A box found on the right-hand side panel of your screen and direct them to all panelists. Uh, we're going to try and get to as many questions as we can, so I'm just going to jump right into it. Um, based on the timing of this, I'm sure this question is for Tina. You mentioned that, that you do routine risk assessments, um, but how frequently do you do those? We do them in a month. We're now doing a monthly. It's our Environment of Care Committee. We developed um, a checklist specifically for the Behavioral Health Unit, and we've incorporated that into Actually, I don't think it's monthly. I think it's quarterly. It's quarterly. We do a monthly environment of care tour as a team, and then the behavioral health unit is done quarterly now. And it used to be we might have done it once a year. Not saying we didn't routinely walk around and do safety checks, but we didn't do a true risk assessment. Um, so now we're going to be doing them quarterly. That's our plan. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have just questions also for you. You mentioned that you have electric beds, and you mentioned the length of the cord. How did you secure those cords? And if you were using O2 concentrators, how did you secure those cords as well? So um, our, our cords are attached to the bottom of the beds. If you literally pull the bed away from the wall, it comes unplugged. That's how short the cords are. Um, so, and then as far as them being able to be used, they, can't, they don't come off the bed because they're attached in multiple different ways by the company and then my maintenance crew here secured them as well. But then also um, our beds are locked in the lowest position with a code that nobody can access but the staff. Um, so the patients never know the code to be able to elevate the bed. Um, what was the next part of the question? I'm sorry. Oxygen. Oh, oxygen. Uh -huh. So that is something we have not remedied. We do take patients with oxygen. We do take patients with CPAP. And at this point, we have moved forward since the risk mitigation plan started in the fall. We have moved to one-to-one -to -one for those patients when they're using oxygen or CPAP. Okay, that, has, that also has been a challenge for us in that our behavioral health unit does not have one-to-one um, -one aids as part of our staffing. So 
um, were often having to um, ask for support from the remainder of the medical unit for that. That's something we're going to have to address as we move forward because we do see, we're seeing a higher volume of folks that are using CPAPs and O2. So. Okay, thank you. Uh, this question is for Carol. Uh, why is there such a huge focus on risk assessments rather than the clinical decision making of the staff that are actually caring for suicidal patients? Uh, that's a really good question. And I think that, you know, I think for the, the CMS and Joint Commission, I think they have looked so much at the environment because so many patient suicides that have been reported have really happened based on environmental issues like the hangings over the door and those sorts of things. I do believe that there is still a strong focus on, you know, using clinical um, training and clinical awareness of patients. I think it's a combination of those two pieces. But I think it goes back to the whole piece of if we don't know that we need to mitigate it, we're not mitigating it. And so I think that's why risk assessment is so huge. I think being able to look at the environment and identify those things have really reduced or are beginning to reduce the numbers of suicides that are happening in hospitals. Uh, what type of education is provided to non-clinical staff? And is this done during orientation and then annually, or what other kind of um, timing or, or, or uh, what other training tools are used? I guess for, for any, well, I guess we can start with, uh, with Tina and Shauna first. Um, as far as non-clinical staff, I mean, most of the things that uh, we have a dedicated housekeeper that works on our unit every now and again, he has to be off. So we do provide an orientation when they first come to our department that teaches them about the use of our beds. Also, if they see anything that alarms them on the unit to come alert the staff immediately. Um, I don't think we have, with that, and we have competency fairs that also focus on some of that. I do believe that's an area that we could beef up on as far as providing more education. I, Tina and I were discussing about using the risky rooms and setting up kind of yep. um, those pictures and some scenarios in a room. Because we were talking about some real-time education for staff to come down and talk to some of us about why this is important. And I think we're going to do that probably using those pictures from the risky rooms. So we have used those pictures in the past already with um, some of our general nursing staff and in our patient safety committee. I, I may it, be biased, is, but I think it sounds like a great idea. It, it is apparent that non-clinical staff, um, and I, I hate to say non-clinical staff, but even folks that don't work in behavioral health or have never worked in behavioral health do struggle with as Carol has said, not really being aware of what some of the risks are. They don't view those things as risks where in behavioral health we may. Um, very apparent to us recently, we had a long-standing one-to-one uh, patient on our unit and we were borrowing aids from other floors and they commented to us repeatedly when we were handing off care um, that they weren't aware that this was a risk or that was a risk or perhaps we should do that. And I think they're learning some of those principles. So it definitely makes me aware that we need to spread more of that knowledge and share it with our general teams, both clinical and non-clinical off of the behavioral health unit. Yeah, I would agree. At UPMC, we have been working really hard in developing some basic training for what I'm going to just continue to refer to as a non-clinical staff, thinking about housekeeping and dietary and those, those sorts of folks so that they get you know, a bit of education when they come on to the unit if there's, a, if there's a suicidal patient so that they're aware before they go in there. But as part of initial orientation and annual training, they're learning a little bit more about what kind of, about a little bit about suicidal patients, about behavioral health, and a little bit about, you know, what kind of things they need to be concerned about. So that if a patient asks, hey, can you go and get me this, that they recognize that they're not going to go and get that even though the tendency is to want to do what we can to provide a happy time for, for patients, you know, a happy environment for patients. I think people tend to try to do very nice things. But I think that training is really important, uh, both at the beginning and then ongoing for um, all staff. Okay, thank you. Uh, we do have a couple more questions. Unfortunately, we're not going to have time to get to those today, uh, but we can pass those along to our panelists uh, and reply by email to all of those participating. I want to thank everyone for joining us today. This concludes our webinar for today. Thank you.